Good morning. On behalf of the Center for the Study of the Presidency and Congress, welcome. Thank you for uh, joining us uh, for this conversation today. Um, as many of our, our, our participants probably know very well, um, the, the Center has been approaching um, several issues of uh, the overlap between technology and national security um, under the banner of a geotechnology competition program. Um, we tend to focus on a few specific areas where a rapidly developing technology is uh, both providing new opportunities and also challenges for policymakers who we know sometimes um, can have a hard time keeping up with changing technologies and with the um, understanding of their constituents of those various technologies um, in their effort to make good public policy uh, and in their efforts to secure uh, the nation. We have focused several years back on uh, cybersecurity uh, of the energy grid um, and have focused more recently very deeply on competition over uh, 5G, uh, communications technology, uh, advanced computing technology, and um, energy is kind of one of those things that ties a lot together. We are highly dependent on it, but when it works well, we don't think too much about it, and that's probably good, but there's a danger in that as well. <laughs> um, it's vital for us to understand the underpinnings of um, the technology that drives our day-to-day -day lives, and Amy Myers Jaffe uh, has uh, done some great work in pulling together a book on what we need to know about innovation and in technology and how that's changing. Um, I particularly liked the, the subtitle of the book. The book's called Energy's Digital Future, Harnessing Innovation for American Resilience and National Security. Um, you could probably use that, that um, subtext as um, the title of one of our programs because it's very, very close to how we see um, the challenge and the opportunity. Obviously, energy big in the news right now, um, and so we're pleased to be hosting Amy at this time. I want to turn it over to um, to, to our moderator for today, who will um, take it from here. Um, Robert Gerber is a senior fellow at CSBC, uh, recently retired um, career member of the U.S. Foreign Service, um, worked for both the State Department in many overseas locations and. U.S. trade rep focused on digital trade issues and technology. Um, and um, Robert is also a consultant for a renewable energy company called Icewind, so also uh, spends some time in the energy sector. Robert, let me turn it over to you to take the conversation forward with uh, Amy, and thank you both for doing this today. Thanks very much, Glenn. And uh, it's a pr privilege today to talk with Professor Amy Myers Jaffe. She is a former journalist and currently a research professor at the Fletcher School at Tufts University in the Climate Lab there. She is also co-chair of the Women in Energy Steering Committee at Columbia University. She's the author of several books on energy policy, the oil industry, and geopolitics. And as Glenn mentioned, her Latest book, which just came out, is Energy's Digital Future, Harnessing Innovation for American Resilience and National Security. So thanks for joining us today at this CPC, CSPC book talk, Professor Amy Myers Jaffe. Um, if I could, I'd like to start off with, with a question for our author, and that is to start with a definition of digital energy, which is the focus of your book. We're, we're talking about what, smart thermostats in the home, microgrids, Tesla wall batteries, right? But what else does it encompass? Well, you know, I, I take a very broad definition. Um, so I think about, you know, what are the things that we have to fuel that we might be now fueling with fossil fuels that might someday electrify in addition. So I'm looking at 3D printing as an advanced manufacturing technique, looking at um, self-driving vehicles, drones, um, optimization programs. You know, we're all doing e-commerce these days and you don't realize there's an algorithm behind that where, you know, you ever notice that the Amazon truck is stopping like at every house on a block at the same time every day? That's because some computer algorithm using a artificial intelligence decided 
what was the most fuel saving way to bring all those packages to you? Uh, that can be a much more carbon saving way than having everybody individually drive from store to store looking for the goods they need. So a lot of things come under the digital, you know, heading, so to speak. Um, but, you know, of course, in the energy sector, we think about distributed energy, we're having battery storage, um, looking forwardly about um, how smart electricity meters might change our relationship with our utility. Will we be selling to our utility and buying back? Um, would that all be automated? How will we be doing that? So many of these different things um, I go into in the book. So the book is a little bit, you know, with my professor hat. Um, teaching you about energy policy and international relations. But, you know, there's a couple of chapters like the Meet the Jetsons chapter that really just tells you, you know, what your house might look like 10 mm -hmm. years from now uh, when people offer you that Alexa can be in charge of everything. And uh, what would the risks of that be? Yeah, it's a very interesting read. And uh, going back to going to chapter one, you, you describe a, a revolution that's going on in terms of digital energy, and we're in the middle of it right now. Um, but it wasn't always that way. And in your book, you tell a story about one of the first meetings between Silicon Valley tech industry and the energy industry, aka the oil industry. And, and you were there for that. I, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that meeting and why these two groups were so unfamiliar, unfamiliar with each other or even suspicious of one another. Well, you know, it, it really was an amazing thing because I what used to be a professor at Rice University, and then I moved to University of California, and I would go back to Texas to meet with contacts and give speeches and talks, and, um, and the shale revolution was happening. And I would say, well, you know, uh, let me show you this solar battery system that they're starting to put in in California and how it's replacing natural gas. Um, and, you know, this is something that is important to understanding the landscape for the energy future and climate change is becoming a bigger issue. And, you know, you're going to have to capture your methane and, and so forth. And people didn't heckle me, but, you know, they kind of patted me on the shoulder and said I drank the Kool-Aid since I've gone to California. And they were very patronizing. And then I would go out to the valley and I would say, listen, you're not understanding all the forecasts for your products on the energy side involve your projections that natural gas will be seven dollars per million BTU as a price, but it's going to be two dollars. Mm. And it's going to be exported worldwide. Like you're not getting with the program. You know, your products have to be competitive in a world where oil and gas prices could be very low. Mm. And again, patting me on the shoulder, like I don't get it. That's old industry. It's past the day. Right? You know, it's going to be over soon. And I'm like, oh, my God, I, I, no one's listening to me. No one's believing me. I'm getting everybody together. And so I did. I made this sort of getaway um, Chatham House rules event where I brought leaders from the oil and gas industry together with leaders from Silicon Valley and a few people like myself who were, you know, professors that write about both. And it was just mind open. In fact, I had the feeling that the sessions where we're all speaking we're getting in the way of the like, you know, networking coffee break. Hmm. Um, and it led to some very productive outcomes. Number one, digital technology, uh, sensors and, and other kind of computer assisted devices are going to be instrumental in making sure that the oil industry can operate safely. And by that, I mean, not having spills, detecting fluids going to the wrong place instantly so they can shut down. Um, uh, absolutely going to be enabling or are already enabling for the companies that have successfully stepped up to the plate. And I congratulate them to end the methane leaking out of their systems, all digital technologies that enable that. Um, and, you know, on the flip side, uh, you're starting to get companies to collaborate on doing renewable energy together and doing offshore wind and other things. So, you know, hydrogen, um, the first big, a collaboration between a major oil company and a hydrogen company came about from my seminar. So, you know, really important for these two industries to get together. And, you know, but 
there's the but. Like we all woke up last week and watched what happened to Colonial Pipeline. Yeah. So the but is it's great that these technologies are enabling, but we have to make sure that we're upgrading mm. all of the cyber protections that go with having these sensors and go with having automated systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that makes sense. And you, you raise the issue of that there's more attack space for cybersecurity threats now that we have a digitally enabled energy system. And um, I was thinking you mentioned the, the shale uh, boom in the United States, which led to shale exports, energy exports. Um, and that now the renewables are, on the, are on, the, on the upswing. Prices are dropping. There's a push at government and industry to reduce carbon emissions. But it's not all a rosy picture, right? And we have what happened last week or two weeks ago with the Colonial Pipeline. And um, can you tell us a little bit more about, um, about these uh, negative externalities? So, so there's two there's two sets of things we have to consider. Uh, the first one, which I just want to get off the plate, and then I'll go back to cyber, is that we don't want to get to a point where we're using these technologies. We could use these technologies greatly to reduce carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. But if we use them in a way that's convenient without any regulatory or consumer consideration of the carbon output, from using them, then we're in a bad place. So if everybody's taking Uber from a gasoline car, the fact that they don't own a car doesn't matter because the research has already shown that individuals riding in Ubers uh, are moving out of the free COVID, we're moving out of the subway system or moving out of transit. And therefore, that's increasing congestion, increasing vehicle miles travel. In increasing emissions. Great that the technology companies that are doing deliveries to us are using these algorithms mm -hmm. that mean that delivery logistics are unbelievably sophisticated. That's how they can tell you that your package is arriving at 204 because the driver doesn't even get to decide what turn to make. It's all GPS, you know, automated. The packages are in there based on a scan for efficiency. That in that whole system, UPS went to that system in 2017. They eliminated 100 million miles of vehicle travel. Just mm. putting in one of these optimization programs, McKinsey estimates that's going to take down oil, oil, oil use and emissions by 25%, just, just those kind of programs alone. But mm. if you wanted to have five-minute delivery, mm. and that meant in a big city like New York City, Amazon was driving around the city in a gasoline diesel warehouse truck. Right. Making, you know, stopping and ha doing that instead of a stationary distribution system that could be on renewable energy with renewable energy robots. Mm -hmm. um, if you're just driving around with a diesel truck causing pollution, congestion, and emissions, that's a bad outcome. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say it's, in, it's an environmental imperative to make sure that we're using these technologies to assist us to lower emissions and not the opposite. Now on cyber, you know, ditto, right? They could be great. We've got great tools, um, authentication tools, encryption. We have all these tools to sort of protect infrastructure. And um, unclear if we're using them. And right. if we are using them, do we have them properly updated? I mean, if you think of how many times in a random week, month, year, you know, your smart device company is sending you a patch or a fix or fix the bugs in this app. You know, we don't think about that. We just think about the inconvenience. It's like, oh, these guys are sending me this thing again. I got to stop using the device. I got to do the upload, right? But imagine if you're 5,500 miles of Colonial Pipeline and you've put in an automated system for billing. Mm -hmm. How brilliant are you? Well, you're brilliant until you realize that you didn't upgrade your systems so that no one could hack into that system and get to your operational side, mm -hmm. right? Now, the consequences of someone getting to the operational side of a major fuel artery in the United States is unthinkable. Along that pipeline, we had DOD command fueling. We had military bases. 
We had other vital industry. We had um, mm -hmm. other, you know, vital pieces of, of, of infrastructure that uh, required fuel, our whole transportation system, diesel for trucking up and down the East Coast. Um, these are really consequential uh, uh, activities. And you can imagine in a war setting, how unbelievably irresponsible it would have been if we'd have found out in a war that mm. some enemy of ours was able to exploit a ransomware attack and mm -hmm. turn off the fuel system for the eastern U.S. It's unthinkable. In a way, we're lucky. That's why I was quoted a lot as saying it's a Sputnik moment. It's a Sputnik mm. moment. Yeah. Like, thank God it turned out the way it did. And I understand how inconvenient it was for some drivers in Virginia and D.C. and, mm -hmm. you know, Georgia. Yeah. Um, but you know what? With all due respect, this was not a gasoline issue. The allusions to Jimmy Carter are completely inaccurate. Mm -hmm. This is a moment, a wake up call for national security. All our vital infrastructure, it has to be revisited. The mm -hmm. fact that in 1978, you know, Colonial put in a really sophisticated SCADA, you know, safety system, and then they got an award for it 10 years later, and maybe they upgraded a little bit. You know, guess what? If you didn't upgrade it a month ago or six months ago, not good enough. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then also, what's your response plan? Mm -hmm. every, every piece of major infrastructure in this country needs to have a response plan. So it's not just, you know, do I have the proper protections for my SCADA system and, and other systems that I'm using? You know, do I know what my authentication is? Do I know that none of my authentication is floating on the dark web? Like all of those things. But in addition to that, what's your response time? Do you know what you would do if you were under attack? Do you know how you would restore your system and how fast and how long it would take you to do? Do, you, do your employees know exactly what they're supposed to do? Does everybody know to turn off their computer? Do you have a system where once you know you have a hack, you have some button you can push and turns everything off? On the subject of infrastructure and, and the importance of cybersecurity, and I just wanna pause and, um, and welcome our, our guests, our participants, uh, Folks can submit questions in the in the Q and A, and we'll turn to those questions later in the conversation. But on infrastructure and cybersecurity, um, I, I need to ask: uh, the, the Biden administration has a rather large infrastructure package that it's presented and discussing with Congress right now. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, what do you think is? Uh, what are some uh, upsides to it? Things that will that are, are going to help us with our strategic objectives here? And what uh, what do you think is missing from that? So there's been a lot of debate about, you know, so one of the things that's in the infrastructure bill is adding uh, electric charging stations. And people mm. are like, look, you know, look at what happened in Texas. The electricity went down. And then, of course, a lot for transmission. My mm. opinion is those two things are, are real solutions for resilience. Okay. Right. Had Texas connected more to more trans with large transmission to different states. Um, and it had actually gone major forward. I mean, Texas, you can't criticize them. You know, amazing pr uh, uh, progress in wind, um, but also a huge potential in solar. So if Texas had a major initiative to bring on all the renewables in the state, and then they were connected by, you know, great uh, co connections by transmission, the imbalance market that could have come out of Texas would not only have prevented what happened to Texas, but could be a security resilience uh, 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 bone for all the states around Texas. But in addition to that, um, so so the administration's focus on transmission, you know, transmission, 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 that's a good thing. I believe in the charging stations, and I'll tell you why. If we have a climate event, or even if we had a hack, you know, what are the chances that every place is hacked at once? Hopefully, God forbid, that won't happen. So. So one of the things we learned in Hurricane Sandy is that there were towns that were had uh, smaller grids, so they were able to restore their electricity more quickly than other places. And one thing we know from Hurricane Sandy, and also from myself from living in Texas so many years, no electricity, you're not getting any gasoline. 
Right. You need electricity at your gasoline station to pump it. You need electricity at the wholesale rack where the trucks pick it up to bring it to your gasoline station. Without mm-hmm. electricity, there is no gasoline. There is no diesel fuel. So right. to pretend that we can't go to electric cars because we need electricity for them, you know, mm-hmm. if you had electricity and you had a backup generator in your house, you can mm-hmm. plug in your car in your garage. You're good to go. Mm-hmm. That's what we found in Sandy. People who had electric cars were the only ones who could drive. Mm-hmm. So, so all that's great. What I worry about is there is not a big enough line item in this infrastructure bill for cybersecurity. Mm-hmm. You know, we need to be assisting companies and the grid and, you know, to really enhance cybersecurity and the cybersecurity piece. You know, if you're putting in a microgrid mm-hmm. at some military bases in the United States to really make sure that you're really resilient, both from climate change and other kinds of uh, incidents. If you're doing that and you are not investing in cybersecurity across all government-owned entities, and then to share that knowledge, Mm -hmm. I mean, I get it. You know, I can tell you in the oil and gas industry, you know, if I go and tell you that the government wanted to come in and, and help you do something in your cybersecurity domain, you might feel like you don't want to be connected to the government um, because what if they're hacked? Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, we still need to have regulation. There still should be standards. If you're in, you know, after September 11, you know, Colonial Pipeline couldn't just say, well, it's 5,000 miles. We don't feel like protecting it. Right. So it's the same thing for cyber. There need to be Maybe we have to re- revisit, um, you know, are you a level one infrastructure? Then, you know, it's not your choice whether it's a good investment or not um, mm-hmm. to add extra security to your systems. You know, mm-hmm. it shouldn't be optional. It shouldn't be voluntary. Mm-hmm. It could be secret. We could have a secret panel in the government that comes and meets with you and say, we've determined that you're vital infrastructure. And here's the regulations that we put in for vital infrastructure. We're going to tell it to you again. Uh, because we don't feel, and you, we want you to demonstrate to us that you are where you need to be. You know, that's a process. It doesn't have to be a public process. Um, but I don't see enough in the bill about mm. that for my mm. taste. I feel like we need to have, you know, when we start to have a bipartisan negotiation about what's getting cut out of the bill and what's being added to the bill, I mm. hope everybody says, oh, yeah, guess what? Sputnik moment. Mm-hmm. Cybersecurity is going to be top of mind in this bill. Wow, that's interesting. You, you mentioned briefly the military, and um, the U.S. military is, of course, the largest consumer of energy in the in the United States. And I was I saw in your book that you describe digital energy technology as dual use technology. In, in other words, it can it can propel our economic uh, prosperity and economic competitiveness, but it can also be, excuse me, a military and strategic advantage. So this brings in the, the, the big question that I have to bring up, which is um, on the international scene, China, our strategic competitor. And um, it's a broad question, but given the importance of uh, digital energy to our economic competitiveness and security, um, how well positioned is the United States to succeed vis-a-vis our strategic competitor? How well positioned is, is China to succeed? You know, let's, let's take a for instance. I mean, you know, it's it's... it's thing by thing. First of all, uh, most international sales of drones today are Chinese drones, Mm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, the Pentagon, no, we always talk about, you know, public investment in science and people like, oh, you know, what, what what has that ever, what has public investment ever led to? So let me remind everybody, we, you only have GPS because the United States government decided to track the Sputnik satellite um, for national security reasons, mm-hmm. right? And, and we have amazing technologies, amazing innovation, um, but China is having a national effort, a national strategic effort. And, you know, the Trump administration accurately captured the fact that their national strategic effort included trying to steal the best and top American technologies, including self-driving automated vehicles. Because, of course, automated vehicles, whether that's aerial vehicles or land vehicles, 
are going to be the means of war in the future. But we can now understand, I mean, step back from a minute, okay? I understand we now all know who Dark Side is, and you know, hopefully there's a bunch of people in Georgia who feel embarrassed about how they behaved at gasoline stations, and they understand now who Dark Side is. But suppose Dark Side had been funded. Right? Yeah, suppose, suppose that just, I'm not saying it was, but suppose that was a foreign government. Mm -hmm. You know, are we prepared? I mean, we know that China's having a national initiative. We're not having a national initiative. Should we be having a national initiative? And people say to me, well, you know, it's the private sector and they're going to stay ahead. Well, you know what? If the smartest people in this country today are developing apps for Angry Birds because people like to play games on their smartphone, then we're not going in the right direction because China's not letting the smartest people in the country make apps for the smartphone. They're making sure that their technology effort is focused on national security. And we need to be at least having some focused effort. I'm not saying that the Pentagon's not doing its job. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that some of it's funding dependent. You know, you get what you fund. Mm -hmm. And and we my opinion is we have not made it an apparent national effort mm -hmm. to make sure that our security is protected because we not only dominate in cyber, mm -hmm. but it's so dominant that it's a deterrent to anybody to hack us. Gotcha. Which you could say, and you know, some people say, listen, we can't show all our methods and means to deter these attacks because we, we need to be, you know, we need to have it secret that we're superior. Well, you know, you know what? The whole point of being superior partly is to be, have to be a deterrent. So there has to be some line between we're holding back because we don't want people to do a minor hack to see what our capabilities are and not having some demonstration of our capabilities as a deterrent. Wow. So this, this is a really broad challenge here. Not only do we need to protect our energy systems, but we also need to be able to produce renewable energy, possibly distributed energy uh, for our, our national interest. But we also want to make sure that it's not only China that dominates world trade in renewable energy technology. So we need to be able to export, manufacture, and protect. I, I, is that right? Am I? That, that's so right. And if you think about the sea lanes today, right? The United States dominates the sea lanes. We're having all these exchanges with China about the South China Sea and the freedom of international navigation and the United States Navy is paramount. Mm -hmm. But what happens when cyber, one wires are the new sea lanes? If we're going to go to a world, a decarbonized world where 50% of all energy is delivered by wire and mm -hmm. has some kind of digital component, what's the role of the Pentagon? Is the Pentagon's role to come in and assist an allied country with cyber is the Pentagon's role to come in and provide backup solar panels and, and batteries for somebody whose electricity gets cut off and needs it for a hospital or needs it for their own, you know, security of, for citizens, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, should the Pentagon be stocking the, the, the equipment to bring in solar and batteries to a place that had its electricity cut off? instead of stockpiling oil or in addition to stockpiling oil? I don't even know if anybody's asking those questions. But mm. in the future, having oil in a stockpile might not be the thing that would actually help you. I mean, it could, I suppose, if you're going to fly in a diesel generator. But, um, you know, you have to ask, what, what's going to be the better form? You know, I had a, a really humorous conversation one day with a friend of mine from the oil industry who's building a ranch in uh, West Texas. And he asked me my opinion as an energy expert. Should he put in as his backup electricity system, solar panels and a battery, a propane generator with a propane tank, or a diesel generator, and then he'll be able to buy the diesel? Which one would be the best idea? And, you know, we talked about it, both of us being energy experts, for an hour. Um, but I, I feel like, where he is, it's a pretty sunny part of the country. I kind of felt he's better off with solar panels and the battery 
than he would be having to worry about whether or not he's going to get a diesel delivery. Mm -hmm. um, because the diesel delivery also depends on electricity. But I have another friend who's an energy expert who put a solar panel on his house mm -hmm. and learned in horror during the Texas electricity crisis, the fact that he connected everything to Alexa because he felt he was so sophisticated and, you know, it's kind of fun, Alexa, do this, Alexa, do that. Um, he, because of some other, you know, mishaps about how he connected his panel, he couldn't island himself from the grid. And so therefore, even having a solar panel, he was in the dark and without heat. Wow. Yeah. It sounds like a, maybe a hybrid solution would, would work in some of those cases, but it just depends on where you are, what your geography is and what the, whether you're connected to the grid or not. This is many, many variables. And, and, and the geography of where you are matters. You know, you, you know, in, in, in Iceland, you have geothermal fac fabulous, you know, a lot of uh, uh, buildings today, you know, Boston university is doing this, but you're seeing some more of this in California. You know, people are figuring out how to, tap geothermal energy for both heating and cooling of a building um, by running, you know, pipes and having a system that go deep underground. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that depends where you are. The other, it depends where you are is, you know, one of the big things, Biden administration infrastructure, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Give you an A plus gold star, fast tracking New England wind. Now, mm -hmm. if we fast track New England wind, and then we attach some electrolyzers to it and we have hydrogen for heavy industry in New England, win, win, win. So it really depends where you are, what's the resource, you know, how are we going to get there? Mm -hmm. Interesting. So interesting that you, we, what we need, it sounds like, is for several different modes of energy production and storage to be allowed to, to grow, to be, to be options in, in the market. And, and it's interesting because... In your book, you talk a lot about path dependency and, and the risks of that. You even talk about going back to Henry Ford and Edison and how um, we initially started off, this is a bit of a tangent, but you know, electric, electric cars were de rigueur in cities like New York City. You could even hail an electric taxi with your phone back then, but then we became dependent on fossil fuels. So um, I, I guess my question is, you know, how do we make sure that the best systems come about for consumers, for, for our future, rather than um, uh, having um, path dependency? And, and the reason I have a chapter in the book, first on the history of uh, gasoline and electricity, um, and then on path dependency, is so we understand what we're doing today. Mm -hmm. So it's not good enough that Apple or, or Tesla or somebody else is going to deliver us a self-driving car and we're going to use it how we want to, right? Because that's the lesson of the 1910s, right? And also in a national security basis. So in the 1910s, indeed, it was, it, was, it was the way people got around. Everything was electrified. You had electric trolley cars. You had uh, these electric tra taxi services. Amazing. And... And if you imagine today, like if we had known, you know, what fossil fuels might result in in terms of climate change, because there were some, you know, early warning voices mm -hmm. about the pollution from automobiles. Sure. Um, but if we'd have known, you could imagine how easy it would have been to digitize electric streetcars and um, robo taxis today and, and have it all be seamlessly unpolluted. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, people are talking about going back to that, having a smartphone where you can tell the electric trolley system, the light rail system to pick you up at a particular time in a different place. Get you have your ticket on your phone. You get in. When you get out, there's a robo taxi waiting to take you the last mile. Mm -hmm. Right. With other people could be a van. Right. So all electrified, all on renewable energy. You could imagine how easy people are talking about that sort of city of the future. That city of the future could have been now, right? And one of the things that derailed that city of the future was not that gasoline was a superior technology because people broke their arms doing the crank. People, people blew themselves up putting the gasoline in their car. Oh. Do you know the gasoline tank used to be under the seat of the driver? I mean, you can imagine something so dangerous. Um, and so, 
and, 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 and these gasoline cars, you know, broke down all the time and the axles broke and, you know, so forth. So it wasn't the superior technology. Electric cars were actually the superior technology at the time. And that's what people don't realize. What actually happened is we went to war in World War I and mm -hmm. we needed to make trucks to, to help our allies mm -hmm. because the Germans controlled the rail system. So all logistics had to be done by trucks by Britain and France. Right, America supplied some of those trucks. Yep. We had to take all our nickel and lead and iron. Everything had to go for munitions, right? And it just killed the electric car industry for a period of time. It never came back. So we need to now, when we think about what we're doing in digital, because you know what? As we learned from Facebook and our elections, you know, don't just believe people when they tell you that it's going to promote democracy, mm. right? You know, because somebody's selling something, of course they make it a positive. The role of a regulator is to think about the externalities and make sure they are regulated. And and that's where we get today. You know, when it's part of its environmental, like oh, we're going to use all these technologies, it's not a reason to live two hours from your house and drive a gasoline car mm -hmm. because you can put the cruise control on and read a book, right? No. So we have the environmental considerations we need to consider mm -hmm. in terms of how we're going to fuel these things, how we're going to fuel data centers, you know, to credit Google, they're starting instead of to just buy carbon credits, they're starting to actually put in renewable energy systems to support the, the high energy use of data centers, which yeah. also makes them more secure because, of course, we need that data for national defense, sure. right? But, but in addition to that, you know, I mentioned in the book at length, my concern about my rights as an American, my right to write this book, my right to have a chapter on China and their, their challenge to the United States. And what's the challenge? In China today, your digital footprint is monitored. Every single person in China is monitored by the government. It's intrusive. If you, if you go out and you're part of a social protest in China and they see you with your face recognition software, you can lose your access to housing. You mm -hmm. can lose your ability to have a job to support yourself and your family. I mean, there are all kinds of consequences to having your digital score, your citizen score as a demerit uh, can have an impact. Taking it to its most extreme, if you're a citizen of Venezuela, your digital ID card, if you're caught out in a protest against the government, you cannot get access to food. I do not think that people are understanding how these technologies can be used. And if I'm trying to write my book and some foreign government didn't want this book published, you can imagine all kinds of digital things that could happen to me that would try to suppress my ability to tell my own government what it needs to know to make sound policy. Mm. And, and, you know, the retirement system of the University of California was hacked and everybody's bank account information was given away. Mm. Now, guess what? That's every retired member from a national lab that's based in California. Wow. You know, just think about that for a minute. No offense to the UC, which was a great employer. I enjoyed working there. Mm -hmm. But this is something that's really serious. Mm -hmm. It has to do with how international censorship could harm democracies, mm -hmm. even if you're far away. And I'm going to criticize President Obama for a minute. You know, let, I'm, not a one, you know I'm not on one team or another team. To me, we're all Americans, right? I felt like the president should have had Seth Rogen to the White House. Who's North Korea to tell me, Amy Jaffe, whether I can find Seth Rogen's film funny or not? I mean, I'm sure it wasn't to the taste of many people. Mm -hmm. I happen to like Seth Rogen's movies. <laughs> I purposefully went to see that movie in a movie theater because mm -hmm. I resented the idea that a foreign government was telling me as an American what movie I could see. That is unacceptable. Totally unacceptable. And that's why this digital revolution matters 
And that's why how we regulate it. The United States needs to lead. Not only do we need to lead in the technologies as a deterrence to others to do harm to us, we mm -hmm. need to lead in the technology so we can lead and show how the technologies need to be re regulated to preserve democracy. Because China is exporting their tools of repression to other countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's very pertinent. We're actually doing a, a book talk next week, uh, The Rise of Digital Repression by uh, Stephen Feldst Feldstein, uh, Feldstein uh, next week. So, uh, but I was, I was interested in how, what is the link there between, you know, China's digital uh, footprint and their ability to track people and, but also their green energy exports. You've linked those together in your, in your book that China, you say that China's uh, green technology exports come complete with Chinese influence on how to utilize censorship of the internet and other uses of technology for political oppression. Can you expand a little bit on that, that linkage there? You know, I mean, I've mentioned, you know, some of the tools they use, whether that's surveillance or, or GPS. I mean, think about this. We're, let's say we're all going to move to automated self vehicles and, and mm -hmm. e-commerce and so forth. Um, all of those things, not only are all those things used in warfare, but all of those things can be ha hacked to do harm. Mm -hmm. I mean, suppose I'm a political leader in the United States or a military leader in the United States. And the Chinese government doesn't like what I'm saying. Can wow. they hack? Can they hack into my car and cause it to go into a, a wall? Mm -hmm. I mean, can they can they hack into my home through Alexa and mm -hmm. tape record everything I'm saying to my wife or my husband, and then play it out on the internet? Mm -hmm. I mean, the 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 range of things that a government could do is very high. All right. So coercion. It, yeah. it, for coercion, you know, I, I have a, a piece out today in the Wall Street Journal on, you know, is electricity coercion going to be the next energy weapon? Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, I think I'm not saying all, I'm not trying to make people paranoid or we can't use these technologies. They're too dangerous. No, right. it's really more. I have to. And if I don't protect the data here in, in the United States, like I, I got it. We can find someone in one minute in Times Square and arrest them if they're mm -hmm. in Times Square to do harm because there's a, you know, a, a, an alert goes out. But mm -hmm. the flip side of that is that you have a record of my face. Right. Right. And, 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 and I am entitled I to the understand. record of my face. Yeah, if yeah. I go to my facial recognition software as my, to open up my smartphone, I mean, I have to tell you, I'm paranoid. I don't use the fingerprint thing to open my phone. I don't use my face for my banking. You know, I'm not have a, I don't have Alexa in my house, right? Why? Because mm -hmm. all of these things could be military tools against not me, but against the person, right? right? Or against the society, or against Washington D.C., or against the Capitol, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we have to think about what protections are we putting in? Europe's ahead of us mm -hmm. in terms of protecting privacy. Yes. Who owns my data? I, I don't think that. These companies should own my data. My electricity company should not own my data. I should own my data, right? And and the fact that you say, well, I can't have service unless I give you the ownership of my data, like that's like a blackmail scheme, mm -hmm. right? It's got to be that the Congress needs to protect my data for my use, for my safety, for my security. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't see enough effort on that. That's yeah. another thing that I'm talking about, because the first step to making sure that a foreign government can't do something to me is to have rules in the United States that a company can't do something to me. Mm -hmm. And then to take a hop, skip and a jump from that, where I'm setting an example and then I'm speaking about it. And mm -hmm. then if I have to decide between buying an American product and buying a Chinese product, I mm -hmm. want you to pick the American product because you care about freedom and privacy. That's right. And then I'll take it a step further. War Powers Act, infrastructure bill, Biden's on the right track. There are just certain things we're going to have to manufacture here in the United States mm -hmm. because we can't have an insecure supply chain for it. Mm -hmm. And energy technology, many energy technologies are going to fall in that category, along with when we've already focused on the advantages. Look at what we did as a country with vaccines and the speed. 
and rapidity, right? Mm-hmm. Amazing. They can do it Amazing. when their minds to I it. mean, you know, uh, President Biden said yesterday in the speech, don't count us out. That's what he tells every foreign leader. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Don't count us out. But let's prioritize beyond bio. Mm-hmm. Energy is a vital interest. The colonial thing is yet another example. If you're in the Texas electricity blackout and you're one of the 200 people who died, ditto. Mm-hmm. Right? If you were in the New York City blackout and you remember, right? It's a vital interest. It needs to be treated the same way. We need to be manufacturing certain things here. Mm-hmm. Energy technology is a vital national security interest. That's a main takeaway here. You would mentioned, uh, Professor, uh, supply chains. And we actually have a question from the audience about supply chains. And I want to go back to another quote from your book, if I may, which says, in the coming digital energy age, the geopolitics of energy will shift from control of access to national re- of re- natural resources to domination of patents, technology, and skilled workforces. But it seems that also supply chain is vital to that. We need the building blocks for our grid, for our renewables, for having a transformer down the block. Um, So what would be your recommendations uh, to the administration or to industry, uh, frankly, um, on how we can make sure we have the supply chain for these new building blocks of a renewable energy economy? So a couple of things. First of all, it's a misnomer when people start saying that China has the world's lithium. You know, Mm. China relies on other countries for lithium. Mm. What China has is the largest arsenal of processing plants and recycling plants for lithium. Mm. They're 60%. So, you know, that's in our power. We can have a, a, a government incentive drive to have recycling for lithium plants in the United States, hmm. right? When it comes, yeah. right, people, I mean, the U.S. military stocks rare earth metals, but, you know, do we have enough processing plants for rare earth metals? I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm guessing that the fact that so many of the processing plants for rare earth metals are in China, that mm-hmm. we should at least be in a comparable situation. Right. And and, you know, it goes down the chain. We're having an R&D program in energy science. It should include um, the 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 metal science of, uh, you know, uh, material science. Right. What kind of materials like people always talk about cobalt as being, you know, copper, and right? copper as being congested in mm-hmm. in certain locations. You know, when I was at Rice University, I, I mentioned him in the book. You know, one of my closest friends was the late Richard Smalley. Just, mm-hmm. I, I can't even, there's no word to describe what an incredible human being he was, both in his vision, his energy, his mm-hmm. imagination, and his just stick to itness that there was a solution. You know, he believed in nano when everybody said there was nothing at the nanometer scale. He built mm-hmm. a, a, the equipment to prove that he was right. An amazing human being. I mean, there's a whole generation of people who did material science under the space program, and they've taught a new generation of students in material science. And GM, for example, has a battery coming out that uses 70% less cobalt. Tesla has a almost cobalt less design coming out. So that's the science matter. So looking at how to eliminate mining from the clean clean future Mm -hmm. um, should be a high priority in R&D. And, you know, a lot of the things we talk about doing R&D in the clean energy space, um, that's too esoteric. Uh, But it shouldn't be esoteric because Mm -hmm. it's going to be the new world. And if to the extent that we have materials that can be made and produced in the United States without mining them and without the environmental impact of mining, the fact, I mean, there's no question we cannot have this energy future that we're talking about without recycling, right? And again, China is a major dominant program on recycling. Like, and what are we doing? We're throwing junk in landfill, 
making that turns it into methane and puts it into the atmosphere. Like, wake up, you know? I mean, I, I don't want to praise China because I hate to praise China for the things they're doing right because I'm so deeply concerned mm-hmm. about the repression and how they use it, how they use these tools. But they are doing a lot of things right in terms of forward-looking industrial strategy. And, and, and we should be in that same position. Europe is already worried about it. They already have the European Battery Initiative. They're mm-hmm. already trying to take advantage of the fact that they themselves have lithium and other metals that can be mined on the European continent. They already have a major battery initiative for manufacturing mm-hmm. to support their car industry. Why don't we? And, mm-hmm. and you know what? You know what the great thing is? In the new world of new energy, alliance systems are going to matter. And the United States, luckily for us, we're in alliance systems with Europe and Japan and South Korea. And mm-hmm. those are going to be the countries that are able to dominate and excel in these areas because they were fast and they were ahead. Japan mm-hmm. and Europe have been have a roadmap for hydrogen. We don't have a roadmap yet for hydrogen. So I think the great thing that the United States has going for it and the president is focused on is reestablishing our close ties mm-hmm. with our traditional allies and thinking about how to work together with them on these important Things that are vital to energy security. Mm-hmm. Well, as a uh, former diplomat, that's music to my ears to hear about how the alli- these alliances matter. Alliances with like-minded countries. I, I agree. We need to work together. Um, another a question you, you mentioned: China. Um, of course, their system of uh, their economy is based largely on state-owned enterprises. And we have a question from uh, CSPC expert James Kitfeld, who says that. The, he, he asks, the situation in the U.S. is that so much of our energy infrastructure is in the hands of private industry, and that industry can be resistant to regulations like resilience and cybersecurity. And how is that different from what's happening in Europe or Asia? Or have do you see a similar phen- phenomenon there? No, I, I think that the Europeans have much fa- been much faster to regulate digital than we have. Um, and, you know, in in Japanese society, culturally, um, I mean, they 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 are uh, able and willing to heavily regulate industry. But you know, you know, Methi is famous for its guidance. You know, here in the United States, guidance is a suggestion we can decide to ignore. You know, in Japan, government guidance is as good as a regulation. Mm. So, you know, we we, you know, I I, I like, I mean. I like the approach the Biden administration has initially taken. I'm going to meet with you and talk to you about what you're going to do. Mm-hmm. And then if you're not going to do it, I'm going to regulate you. Right. I mean, give industry the chance to step up to the plate. Uh, but, you know, if you're not stepping up to the plate, that is the role of government. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't have free markets. That doesn't mean everybody can do what they want. Free markets mean we have a designed market. What do I mean by a designed market? It means that we have a market that does, you know, bidding for prices, you know, up and down based on the value to society and what consumers will pay, right? But within that design, there has to be regulation that takes care of the externalities of society's other values, freedom of expression, environmental protection, personal safety. You know, these are all things, I mean, you would not leave I mean, would you put Google in charge of national defense? Or are you going to have the Pentagon? Is anybody saying we should eliminate the Pentagon and just have Google do it? No. So, but why do people propose eliminating the 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 uh, the, the Department of Energy? Mm-hmm. Because energy is not important. Because we don't have to we don't have to manage the nuclear stockpile. We don't have to have a program in energy R&D because private industry can handle it. I, I don't think so. So, you know, we make these exceptions um, because we're met, we just have these messy, messy gray area things where it's a vital interest, but it's being done by private industry, but they don't want to be regulated. Like when did wanting to be re- And let me, I'm going to make a last point because we're almost out of time, yeah. right? The energy lost more money for itself 
under President Trump when he took off every regulation that they could possibly want off them. Mm. It did not make them stronger. It did not make them more profitable. Our exports fell. Our performance of our companies collapsed on the stock market. The number of bankruptcies was higher, not lower. Right? So with all due respect to the idea that regulation harms industry, mm. it was the other way around. Regulation is what helps industry help itself. That's a very interesting observation. Um, before we wrap up, I just wondered, uh, Professor uh, Myers Jaffe, what uh, what are you working on uh, next in terms of your research? We read your article in the Wall Street Journal today, and um, do you want to uh, tell us a little bit about the um, the organization you're working with at uh, Columbia University? Well, quickly, let me say at Tufts, we've just started a, a large initiative in two areas. One is to look at um, social equity and energy. And by that, I don't mean just underserved communities, uh, which definitely need attention. I also mean the geographical distribution of tax credits, loan guarantee, all the public funding programs that come out in the energy window. You know, is all the money going to the East and West Coast? Because we're a big country and a lot of smart people in different locations. Um, and so we're taking a tackle on that. How to strengthen um, our, our uh, public funding so that we're fair in how we support um, clean energy. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, big, big soapbox mm -hmm. on getting more women to senior levels in energy science, energy industry. Um, what are the, why are, why are there barriers still? Um, mm -hmm. Why are there still barriers for people of color in these fields? Um, so we, we do seminars. Um, I have office hours for women who would need career advice and energy across the spectrum, government, business, uh, a science. And, um, and we're, we've expanded now. It's Tufts, MIT, Rutgers, NYU, Columbia, uh, the new school. So, you know, always looking for new university energy programs that have lots of women who want to be part of our network and uh, attend our event. So uh, with that, I, I thank you for just a great conversation, Robert. And uh, Glenn, thank you for hosting. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure talking with you. And I like that we ended about skills and uh, training the next generation of renewable energy scientists. Um, it's so, so important, the human capacity part of it, and, the ever, and that we make sure that everybody ha has access to those programs and can participate in what you've called the digital economy revolution which is important to our competitiveness and our national security. So I've learned a lot. Thank you so much. I'm going to hand it over to our CEO, uh, Glenn Nye, for the final word. Let me just echo Robert's thanks to you, Professor Myers Jaffe, for being with us today. Um, I'm reminded of how much emphasis we put on education. There is a citizenship component to these challenges. Um, and when technologies are changing, it is challenging to keep up the citizenry with the knowledge they need to participate in the public policy process. One of the most important things that one can do to help that is to do the work you've done and pull together your thinking and research into a book like this that is um, digestible and, and lays out the important issues um, for readers. So thank you for putting together Energy's Digital Future. And we really appreciate your role in helping keep us and our country educated on these critical issues. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And this concludes our program today. I want to thank all of our participants and uh, Professor Amy Myers Jaffe. We hope to see you again soon and look forward to uh, staying in touch. Sure.